Ronnie. Welcome to Movie Junk. How are you? I'm great, buddy. Thank you for having me on, man. So happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you for making the time to, to come on. We have Ronnie Gene Blevins joining us today, who fans have seen in the third Conjuring film. Father Stu with Mark Wahlberg, Death in Texas, Emancipation, fresh off the release of the epic finale of Tulsa King. I can't thank you enough for joining us today. Hey, man, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I've, I've listened to your show and I've enjoyed your guests. So, Thank you. Thank you so much. And there's so much I want to talk about. Honestly, it was really difficult to kind of pinpoint how we were going to get this interview started. But given it's your first time on the show, I'd love to give our fans the opportunity to better understand sort of how your journey first began and how you um, first entered the business. Well, I, 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 uh, I came from Texas and um, I didn't really have a lot of, you know, formal training in my uh, formative years. You know, being from Houston, Texas, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily a, a breeding ground for filmmakers and actors and artists. Um uh, in the you know late 90s early 2000s but I I had always kind of my m parents had bought me a um, a video recorder uh, when I was about 12 and I was always a big fan of movies so I started making home movies you know and um, and I remember I was I think I was a, in eighth grade and I I had seen a Spike Lee film called um I don't know if it was do the it might have been do the right thing or she's mm -hmm. she's the one she's got to have maybe it was do the right thing, um and then I and I it, you know back in back in the days on you know before streaming you would have a few cable networks and they would just play these movies over and over again oh I mean they still do but so I remember seeing that movie over and over again just being floored by it and then one day I was at the at the library and I saw um, a Spike Lee a book about Spike Lee and inside was a uh, a, a portion of the screenplay and then and so I, I I took out that book and I brought it home and I waited for do the right thing to be on again and I, I like I waited for the 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 pages in the script that the movie would sync up to and I was watching the actors say the the script that was in this book and it just blew my mind you know it was kind of like a peek behind the curtain um but so I was, you know, sort of just a, if I had a hobby in my, uh, you know, uh, early teens, it would be kind of making home movies with my little brother. Um, but, you know, I, I never gave it much weight or consideration uh, and certainly never thought of it as a career path. But, um, you know, I went to uh, University of Texas A&M and, and I thought the, the whole goal was to get out and start making money. And, and, uh, and you know, I didn't realize that 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 wasn't a good model for happiness just kind of like not really uh not really uh putting a standard on what the job was just just uh working so I, I i worked for a mutual fund company when i graduated university i i, I had a bad time i went into a depression and then i just kind of had this inkling of an idea that i needed to move to la with no no training and and uh and just and start uh and, and try to become an actor so I did that when I was 22 and then, you know, of course, not knowing anything and, and, and not, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole track that I had to learn. I didn't know that, you know, someone would say, well, you know, actors are in, in unions. I'm like, unions, aren't those for like, like, like uh, construction guys and like, yep. you know, like, the, you know the joint then, fitters. So I sat at the back of a, 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 a class, uh, Jocelyn Jones and, and, uh, and started, just kind of watching and, and participating. And, and, and then I, I went on and studied with another great teacher, Stephanie Fury. And, and between these two ladies, I think over the course of probably a good eight years, I did nothing but just kind of um, learn, you know, what I was doing. And, um, and, uh, and, you know, just kind of grinded it out from there, got my first agent. I think I got, you know, I wasn't really getting a, a, a lot of, um, I wasn't getting a lot of work even after like all this training and even having like this sort of uh, this, this uh, beginner's agent, you know, um, I just, so I, I uh, wrote a movie that I produced and starred in called American Cow Slip with, um, with, you know, we made it for like a million dollars. It had Val Kilmer. It had, uh, it was Peter Fox last movie, Diane Ladd, uh, Bruce Stern, Bruce um, just this great, this great eclectic cast and this dark comedy, but that never, 
that never really um, hit, but it it put me in the driver's seat and, and like I was forced to lead this movie and kind of figure it out. And um, I think once we started shooting that, that's when I started kind of uh, getting these jobs on TV and, and, and independent films and whatnot. No, that, that's amazing. I mean, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's you know, a similar path to sort of what we hear, you know, when, uh, you know, folks are looking to break into the industry, right? It's sort of like you start from like, you know, either rock bomb right in the beginning. And it's, it's hard to make that gamble to, you know, switching from a job. Uh, that's sort of different, right? Because, you know, you're, you're getting a guaranteed salary versus getting into the acting business. It's a gamble. You don't know when your next, um, you know, big offering or, or big uh, job is going to come up, right? So going in, kind of making that sacrifice and kind of, you know, getting that break with, with the, you know, creating your own project. And, you know, mm -hmm. Bruce Dern, you know, and you also worked with him in uh, Death in Texas. As well, yeah, too, yeah. Right? He, was, became, he became sort of a friend and a mentor after yeah. um, we made American Castle in 2007. And uh, we we shared a manager. I actually think I got him. See, he, oh, Rip Torn was in the film as well. Rip Torn, and, too, uh, yeah. And I met a manager, Alan Summers, you know, a great guy, great manager that I would be with for many years. And um, I met him on set because he was Rip Torn's manager. And then from that, I you know i i ended up getting bruce with uh alan who's still his manager to this day um and then you know i was able to circle back around uh, like you know 12 years later when we were making death in texas to hire uh bruce Dern to play the villain and and death in texas so yeah i got introduced to uh death in texas from our interview with john ashton uh yeah. we actually one of our very early um, when we kicked off the podcast, we were, we were fortunate enough to get John Ashton to join, who I loved in Beverly Hills Cop. And he's back to be in Beverly Hills Cop 4, which is about to come out in a few months, hopefully. So that's yeah. how I got introduced to the film and, you know, being a huge fan of uh, Bruce Dern as well, too. I mean, what was it like, you know, working uh, on set, you know, with with these folks? Uh, what was what was that sort of reunion like? Yeah, legends. It was amazing. Well, let me say John Ashton's a good buddy of mine. I, we went to uh, uh, we had steaks at Dantana's a couple months ago. Um, wow. And I met him through a film called Uncle John, which is a really good movie. If you if you haven't seen it, you should check it out. It's some of his best work. Um, uh, well, these guys, what's it like working with like John Ashton and Rip Torn and Bruce Dern? These guys were always kind of my uh, my acting heroes, you know? Um, and I you know, like a lot of these, like kind of these anti-heroes yeah. that had their heyday in the 70s. Um, you know, like I say, Rip Torn, you know, Bruce Dern, um, you know, uh, Peter Falk, even like, you know, J Jack Nicholson, obviously being like the, the, you know, my number one. But these these guys all kind of came up together and um, and, you know, a, a number of them have since passed. But these have been my heroes because I felt like they were they shined in cinema and uh, a period of time, you know, the 70s and, and a little bit of the 80s when they were more inclined to take on these these. I don't know if you want to call them antiheroes, but they yeah. would give a lead to someone who was uh, who, who wasn't the, uh, you know, necessarily the most um, uh, best looking guy, just kind of this quirky character actor. I feel like the 70s were a good time for the character lead. You know, so so it was amazing because the, these were my heroes. I mean, so w when I first moved out here um, and before I joined SAG, I was so I was so obsessed with Rip Torn before I had even worked with him. Um, Love that, Rip I, Torn. that, you know, my 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 the name on my birth certificate is Ronald Gene Blevins. So my name, Ronnie Gene Blevins, that's my name. Right. Um, so. But at first I was like, well, what is my name going to be? My stage name. And I, so I even thought, well, it's going to be Ron G, like Rip Torn. And then, wow. Wow. <laughs> and then I think like uh, one too many people alerted to me. Well, you kind of, it kind of sounds a little bit like a porn star name. So <laughs> I, I, uh, I shifted away from that. But these guys were great, man, because they were, they were older. They, they were, um, they were willing to kind of um, mentor me in a sort of way. And, and uh, they, they, they they still had their edge and they had so many great stories and, and really kind of taught me how to work, you know, um, because yeah. because I got a chance to work with these guys in 2007. Um, I am, um, you know, it allowed me to develop a friendship with them. And then it it, it 
and I, I went back and would just kind of revisit all their uh, all their films, you know. So m most of my heroes are 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 dead or you know are old, <laughs> you know. Um, and uh, and yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's it, yeah. it's it's been very special to work with these guys, you know. Yeah, we lost uh, you know Rip Torn, you know, not too long ago, you know, a few years yep. back. But I I was first introduced to him uh in summer rental with uh with john candy oh so uh, good remember remember him he was the uh the pirate oh yeah yeah, yeah in summer uh, rental arr, and yeah he was amazing he was, uh, he was it, awesome in that yeah i mean he uh he's been good in so many things have you ever see wonder boys he's great in wonder boys yeah yeah um, yeah yeah uh so funny i mean and and he did such great work on the uh, the larry sanders show mm -hmm. um He's a trip, man. He 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 was really, really, uh, you know. It, I got to work with him. Uh, I think it was a couple of years before he had passed on, you know. Um, but he was, uh, you know, he was raw. He was a curmudgeon, and he was just amazing. <laughs> I know a lot of like the the modern, like maybe the younger crowd is really uh, familiar with him in Dodgeball, right? Dodgeball, and great. Is he is he anything like the characters that he plays? This like loud, outlandish, you know, just you know, yelling and up front. Is he anything like his characters, or is he just a brilliant actor that can just you know convey that on the screen? Well, I think probably both. You know, um, he, uh, he 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 you know he he's he just, he definitely had a, a an edge about him. You know, but it it was also incredibly likable and incredibly generous and and kind. You know, um, and just fun to play with. You know, he um. There was this, and there's a scene in, in American Cowslip where, um, well, you know, we're shooting this, the movie out of order, right? And he, so I know the drug dealer, I'm, I play a heroin addict, right? And, and, the, and he plays my landlord that lives next door. So the drug dealer drops off this heroin and it's in my mailbox, you know? And we're shooting like, you know, Rip's character is not supposed to know about this until later in the movie. And we're shooting like, uh, the the one of the first scenes of the movie, so Rip says, "Well, you know, if I uh, if I know that the drugs are in your mailbox, then I'm going to go to the mailbox and look for them." And I said, "Well, yeah, no, I understand that, but you know, this is the the early part of the movie, so you know, as far as the narrative is concerned, you don't really know that the drugs are in the mailbox." And then he stops and he he says, "Yeah, but I know the drugs are in the mailbox, so I'm going to go for the mailbox," and. Yeah, we did this whole back and forth. And I, again, I said, well, listen, again, in terms of the narrative, if you go towards the drugs in the mailbox, it's not going to track because at this point in the story, you don't know about the drugs in the mailbox. And he pauses and he says, yeah, but if I know about the drugs in the mailbox, I'm going to go towards the drugs in the mailbox. And then finally, I just <laughs> kind of looked at him and I was like, well, you could try. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's this look in his eyes. And then the director calls action. And right on action, he goes towards the mailbox. I step in front of him. Then he starts choking me. <laughs> oh my goodness! Choking That's amazing. Me. And then, and then they're like, everyone starts freaking out. And I like the, the director wants Mark David wants to call cut. And I'm like, no, 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 let this play out. And uh, we didn't use it in the film, but you know, he, you know, but the, the, even there is a lesson in there. He's like, listen, man, don't don't tell me about narrative where we're at in the movie. It's you know, I'm gonna play with what I know and and. Uh, and I'm going to use any means to get what I want. Um, so Rip was Rip was cool, man. I, uh, I have fond memories of Rip. As an aspiring, uh, you know, screenwriter myself, it's very inspiring to kind of hear that you know you're able to you know make your own project and you know be able to and obviously not only to to make your own project but get this legendary cast you yeah. know in this film as well too, to where where you can also lead star as well. And you did a brilliant job. And you, it's it's interesting also too with kind of how your um, the roles that you've been in over the last you know decade and a little bit more, you've sort of um, you know been sort of this master in the villain role. You played a lot of villains, uh, so to yeah. speak, recently. Is there is that just more you've been sort of drawn to that, or do you have a preference on playing villains, or sort of how has that sort of come to be? Well, no, I think it was a little bit by kind of accident because I I you know I I. I always used to have short hair and, and never used to kind of um, uh, when I first moved out to Los Angeles and was was training. And and even when I first my, got my first agent, I, I, I think I had more of kind of a jock aesthetic and more of a um, 
you know, uh, uh, not really the villain. But um, when I was when I was preparing for the movie um, uh, American Cowslip, where I would play a, a heroin addict, the director said he wanted me to grow my hair out. You know, and I'd always wore my hair very short or shaved, you know, and uh, I couldn't quite like understand like what how that would look on me, you know. So finally, I uh, thank God Mark David had the good sense to say, you got to you know, you're playing this this character. He, he doesn't bathe. He, he he's a he's an addict. He, you know, he, he's an agoraphobic. He never leaves his house. It was just trust me and grow your hair out, hair out. So I was like, OK, so I started growing my hair out and then, you know, Re again referencing like my my heroes like a jack nicholson or uh you know or, or uh um you know uh um i would um when i had this hair i was like well, what am i going to do with it now so I, I started to slick it back and then and then we were uh a couple months away from shooting american cowslip and um i said well i might as well get some headshots done uh you know with this new aesthetic because i never had this aesthetic you know um, and so I got them done just, just kind of really kind of a half-ass photo done of me with like this thick beard and hair back. And, and it was a, a headshot that my, uh, uh, my, one of my earlier agents started using. And I started getting called in for these kind of villain roles because of where I was in the process with, with, um, about to shoot American Cowslip. And interestingly enough i make american cowslip because i'm not getting work in the business but when i get headshots um done based uh based on my new aesthetic then i started getting work in the business uh to the point where we had to push production back a little bit because i was working on these you know uh these tv shows as a villain so it was kind of an accident and then when i said okay well you know you got to get in where you fit in so when i started working as the villain then i started thinking okay well it just it kind of you know um people say well what don't you hate being typecast and i always say well it's better than being no cast you know yeah um now the last few years I've, I've i've been able to kind of um spread my wings a little bit and, and every now and again they let me do something that's not that but listen you know i'm i'm, I'm grateful to be working and 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 a uh in an in industry uh movies and tv and something that i've always loved so to me, it's uh, every job is a is a blessing of sorts, you know. Yeah, and 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 I mean, thankfully, I mean to your name, I mean, well over a hundred credits. Uh, also, too, um, you know, we've had a resurgence of sort of the horror franchise. I'd say in the last like four or five years, and you were also in the uh, the third Conjuring film as well, too. Yeah. Um, which, if I'm not mistaken, I believe this film was also um, sort of based on a true story. Uh, as well too which kind of makes it a little bit scarier as well one what was it like working on this film and the fact that it was based on a true story were there any paranormal elements that happened on set or anything exciting that you could share from the set uh well yeah um yes it was it was super cool because i was a big fan of uh, the first two conjurings yeah big fan of james wan i think even before i i uh was uh, even heard that I was going to work on Conjuring Three. I felt that James Wan kind of um, he leveled up the genre with Conjuring One, and um, the fact that he was just doing all this with these like practical effects. He kind of just something about it. I don't know. I mean, it, it, I, 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 it was just a terrifying movie, and I think he kind of, I think he put, he reinserted uh, art into uh horror you know what i mean um so i was elated to work on it um and um i think that there's always been from from what i understand this this um this i think vera formiga has had more i think patch is a little more dismissive but vera always has a story and she 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 holds she kind of holds those characters in high regard and she thinks she she handles it with much reference reverence and there's all i think she always has stories about about some supernatural things that have happened um me and myself i've told this story before on another podcast but since you ask i'll, I'll tell it um i uh, i believe in all the, the whole thing you know the spiritual world um you know i believe that we're spiritual beings living in a physical world so um i was a little freaked out to go shoot it um 
and uh, we were shooting it in Atlanta. And um, and so I, my my son was I think two two years old at the time, but I don't know if you do you have children. Uh, no, no, just nieces okay. and nephews. Okay. Well, there's a there's an when you have kids, there's an age before which they become fearful, right? Um, and they usually get it from watching a movie or, you know, it, it usually comes from some sort of media. Right. And then um, but before then, they, they don't they don't have that fear. You know, something happens. To them. Well, this was pre fear. My son, you know, he wasn't really scared of things yet. And he certainly uh, didn't see things that weren't there. You know, no, no imaginary friends or no, no ghosts. This is again, this is um, these are the years uh, when my son was two before he kind of understood when he felt fear of like a of ghosts you know yeah um so um but he was sleeping uh, at that time he wasn't sleeping in his bed he was sleeping with my wife and i and um i was leaving that that day to go shoot the conjuring so i i got this rosary and uh and i go in my room and uh and I, mind you my my wife and my son don't see me go in there i said a quick little prayer and said listen i'm I'm praying to, you know, I'm praying and I'm saying, uh, listen, I'm going to go shoot this, the conjuring three. It kind of freaks me out, you know, cause you hear all these stories, not necessarily the conjuring, although Vera has some stories, but like about people who involve themselves with true stories, um, yeah. uh, ghost stories. And as a result that, that you know, they, they might've been cursed or, you know, that's part of the lore, like the older guys and whatnot. So, yeah. um, so I say, let's, I'm gonna, it freaks me out to so do me a favor. I'm spirit guides. Would you please come and look after uh, my, my wife and my son while I'm gone? I get on a plane. I'm in Atlanta that first night. I get a call at midnight. So, which means uh, it's, uh, it's like 2 a.m. in uh, Atlanta. So, it's, I think it's like midnight here. And my wife is like, oh my God, uh, we were going to bed tonight. And Leo sat up in bed and said, Mommy, who are those people right there? And my wife said, who? She goes, those two people beside beside the bed. Again, Leo had never had never spoken of like ghosts or things that weren't there. He never felt fear before. But, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the day in which I called for his spirit guides to come and look after him, uh, he, he sat up that night in bed and pointed out these 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 people that were beside the bed. So I thought that was a little freaky. Um, That's insane. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but well, two, uh, two but o'clock no. is that, is the, is the devil's hour, they say. Oh, so, is that? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. You know, uh, but you know, uh, on the first day of shooting all the conjuring films, they bl they have a priest come in and bless the set. I don't know if you knew that. Um, and I don't know if like, I don't know if that's just kind of to, to kind of create the lore. Um, you know, but they do it, you know, uh, and, and I don't know. I, 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 it was a blast to shoot um, because my character was the victim of a murder. Um, and it, we we couldn't really we didn't have, you know, um, and that's a sensitive subject. Obviously, someone was uh, murdered. And uh, but also we, we, we not only did we we just didn't have his perspective, obviously, um, but uh you know, so we, he was the one person that was, I think, renamed. So um, my character's name was Bruno and, and I, I'm, God, I'm, this poor guy's family, I'm, I'm not remember his name, but um, so I, I think, I think things were a little, uh, his name was changed and things were a little changed a little bit um, to, um, to kind of out of respect for, uh, for him as a deceased man. So, so it makes sense. So this is why you did Father Stew afterwards to get a movie about a priest to kind of segue, <laughs> segue out yeah. of yeah, what right. you went through in, in The Conjuring. Uh, I yeah. mean, just the, the, the fan of me, um, you know, just, and, and also too, I mean, you're, you're definitely a fan of, uh, you know, the 70s and 80s films, it sounds. I mean, was there like a horror genre or I'm sorry, horror film that you sort of, um, you know, love the most or franchise? I mean, 80s was the, the year decade of the franchises right with freddie and jason and all these guys in halloween yeah. was there a franchise or film that you were sort of drawn to the most or had a favorite well it always changed um i i think 
The Conjuring was that 2011, 2013, or maybe it was a little earlier. The first Conjuring, whenever that was. Yeah. The, the, when I saw Conjuring one, that was the kind of uh, uh, reclaimed the title for me. I think that that's been the the, the scariest, best horror film ever made. Before that, yeah. you know, of course, um, Nightmare on Elm Street used to terrify me. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Exorcist. Um, but even movies like uh, less known movies like uh, like Need, uh, I don't know if you remember the Stephen King movie Needful Things would scare me. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Something wicked this way, uh, something wicked this way comes. I think, um, you know, we didn't have. Uh, so I grew up on these films, and I, you know, I didn't have uh, a lot of censoring. I could kind of watch what I wanted on cable. So, um, yeah, every every few few years there would there would be a horror films that would come along and break the mold. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, uh, I think Freddie really did it for me, uh, when I was a kid, um, you know, and, and more recently it was the conjuring one. I'm telling you yeah. what, that conjuring one really freaked me out, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Freaked me out, like freaked me out and, 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 uh, and made me think that I was being haunted or possessed. I mean, I don't know. It, it freaked me out. So when I got the conjuring three, I was like. I, I was like, man, that's crazy because I, I really, really, really loved and responded uh, to those movies. But it, I, that's always kind of been my path um, where I will, uh, I've, it's happened where I've called that I was going to work with certain people, you know, um, like I remember I watched um, the Eli Roth film called, uh, what's the one with Keanu Reeves? So good. Oh, the, uh, oh, the uh, John Wick? No, no. Keanu Reeves, Eli Roth, Roth directs. Um, he has this affair with two women, and then they like... Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I know the movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've, I've, I've seen the scenes where he's trying oh. to get out of it. He's trying to get out of it with the two girls, but he gets seduced. Yeah, what is that movie I'm forgetting the name. I saw that yeah. movie, and I thought it was <laughs> so good. He and was I awesome thought, in that movie, yeah. Yeah, Eli Roth, man, that's the guy I got to work with. And sure enough, I worked with him on Death Wish, you know? So it's like yeah. I, 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 I fall in love with these movies or filmmakers, and, then, and, and I've been fortunate enough to be able to work with them, which is mind-blowing to me, you know? It yeah. um, doesn't always happen that way, but it's happened a couple of times, you know? I, I Same thing happened with Alma Harrell. Alma Harrell. Um, I was blown away by um, um, the Shia LaBeouf movie, Honey Boy. Honey yeah. Boy. yeah. Um, and it blown awesome, away, yeah. man. It hit me on a profound level. And then, and then when I, uh, and when I, and then I, I got to work with her on Lady in the Lake, which comes out on Apple TV later this summer. Uh, I was like, this is like, I mean, these poor people, like they, because the reason I'm an actor is because it's like it, it's just a way I'm I'm a I'm a fan I'm a consumer and you know being an actor was just a way for me to like be a bigger participant in that which I love which is movies so like these poor people when I work with them I, I think sometimes I have to like stop myself from fanning out on them because it's like it, it's it's like no no it's not disingenuous I'm really a big fan <laughs> you know. I think what made The Conjuring and also like Paranormal Activity is you feel like you're actually with the families. They don't really, they're movies, but they don't feel like movies. They feel like you're actually sitting in there with the fans, right? So I think that's what makes it scary because it feels so realistic. Um, I think it's it's The Conjuring and Paranormal Activity, which were the scariest for me in the last decade plus, like 15 Those years or so, right? Yeah. Because again, it's the practical they don't, they don't effects feel. too, right? Um, the practical so real. effects. It's and plus, there's no like it. The 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 bigger and more absurd the the um, the demon is, uh, then it kind of takes you out of the reality. But when you can't see the monster, and it's just like like which was the case in these movies, it's you know because that's what we you know that plays on all our fears. You know, you're home alone, and you're like, what's that noise? Or like, did I just see that? damn like that like that pencil move a little bit you know yeah. you're a scaredy cat like i am um you know then that plays on all our fears you know and if you think that there is a spiritual this whole spiritual life going on that we can't see which i do um then then it really plays on our fears you know yeah
Yeah, it's it's kind of like the whole thing too. It's like when you close the lights and it's like the second you close the lights, like you feel like someone's right behind you and you're trying to, and for some reason when you get into bed, everything's safe, right? It's like that, that there's nothing behind you anymore. But yeah, yeah the, the hor horror movies are, are just great to to watch and we've had a resurgence. Uh, in the it's like uh, Haley Joe Osment, like, you know, when the, what does he say? You know, when your hair stand up in the back of your head? That's yeah. them. That's them. <laughs> That's another one that we're like, uh, you Makes know, sense. I, I think guys like, um, um, God, what's his name? God, my, my memory is failing me, but uh, the guy who did um, the a Haley Joe Osment movie. What was Bruce Willis? Oh, no, the director? Uh, and Night Shalom? M. Night Night Shalom. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know, um, and James Wan. And then, you know, Michael Chaves kind of, I think, is continuing in that tradition. These guys are, I think, are inserting the, are reinserting the art and the horror and horror cinema, you know. Uh, I yeah. love seeing it, man. David Gordon Green is actually working, the, is making The Exorcist, yep. you know. With Blumhouse. Uh, I can't wait to see what he does with that. I, and, and, man, listen, I, like, I got no pretense or hangups. I would love to just uh, do more horror. It, it sounds so much fun, you know. If I was I was just gonna ask. Yeah, you you stole it from me with Exorcist, right? With uh, Blumhouse, they're working on a um, a, um, a three three movie film deal, uh, kind of similar to what they did with a trilogy. So what they did with Halloween, and uh, I mean, I really liked the the new take that they did and kind of building off of the first movie. And um, I think if they do anything just as close to what they did with the Halloween franchise, I mean, we're in for. Uh, a treat with with this trilogy but what are what are your expectations it sounds like you're also equally as excited well i i okay i think david gordon green is one of the great directors kind of like an Almer Harrell. you know i worked i worked with david gordon green on um on a movie called joe in uh 2012 right um and um so i love everything he does you know yeah um these are true collaborators you know i've worked on on you know um i've had i've had roles in movies where i worked for uh, for months you know and, and had like maybe one or two conversations with with a director you know and it doesn't feel like a collaboration they're they're paying you know because i you know um usually play these kind of peripheral characters that are on they're further down on the call sheet you know i i you know um i I, I these there's a certain type of director that doesn't necessarily they they give their allegiance to their uh, number one number two number three on the call sheet i get it um and uh but um a, a director like a david gordon green and uh and alma harrell and um and they they understand that um it, it's it it's it's all it, it's all equally important you know what i mean um to, to really create this flushed out dynamic uh, movie, you know? So um, I, I'm i getting a little tangential, but to answer your question, I can't wait to see what David does with The Exorcist, you know? Yeah, and this is what you get when you have, I mean, brilliant creators, but also uh, fans that make movies, right? These are fans of these genres that just happen to be brilliant filmmakers, right? Kind of like what we're seeing with the Cobra Kai franchise and these types of series and movies. When you're getting fans that are brilliant filmmakers that are making, even like what John Favreau is doing with like the Star Wars shows that he's a part of, right? You're getting some just brilliant continuity and you're getting, you know, fan, fan, the content that the fans want to essentially see, right? So uh, I'm, I'm excited I think that for that's it. the difference. I think that that's the difference, you know, um, you can, you can have a director go in there and they, they're, they might be more technicians, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and maybe they can make a competent film, but I think where you're really getting that, um, the difference is you get true, the great, you, you, I think you just nailed it. The, the great directors I know and that I've worked with are, 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 I think fans first, because then they show up to work every day and their, their, their ideas their um their their um their collaborations um it's all born out of enthusiasm for what that day is going to bring and how it fits into the tapestry of the overall film which is all informed by years and years and years of watching these things that they loved and how can they be a part of the uh you know uh you know the next generation of directors can they be a, you know can they contribute 
the the film that's gonna the next film that's gonna be studied at AFI that's gonna be a part of um, the collection of these these next breed of filmmakers what they're gonna study and what they're gonna get excited about you know and uh, a guy like David man he there's <laughs> he's the best man he's the best you know um, and I can't I I, oh, I I I always look forward to see what he's gonna do next you know I didn't see the Halloweens. Uh, because I never, that's one that I never could quite um, muster up, like uh, uh, care for is Mike Myers for some reason. But I will concede that it might be something that I'm just, uh, it, like everyone talks about the original Halloween. So mm -hmm. maybe, it, maybe I should probably, should probably watch it because I haven't watched it. <laughs> I, I definitely would suggest watching the original franchise. It's going to be a lot of work. Knock out the original franchise um, okay. from part one to part six. And it gets a little confusing because this series has been reset, I think, a total of like four times. So you got one through okay. six, which is one straight, you know, continuity from, from one to six. Then you got Halloween H2O, which is basically a direct sequel to part one or part two i believe so i think it goes one two that was the rob zombie oh. one no no this was the one that came out in 99 which was 20 years later okay so with, with jamie lee curtis so that okay. was the first time that they did a reset okay and then well technically if you count halloween three that was also a reset because that was uh its own separate movie but then the rob zombie came out and made his own version of part one and part two which is its own franchise different from the original um, uh, franchise that was from the 70s and 80s and then we get this new version with um, Blumhouse and David Gordon Green which is a direct sequel to part one so part two and beyond doesn't exist um, so that way you can get a better sense because um, they they do a lot right they you have a different appreciation where you kind of see like where Michael was initially and then kind of some of the stuff because they bring in elements from the original franchise there's like oh i remember that was from part two or hey that was from part six right. um but and in, in the way that i saw this franchise that part one was amazing i loved uh part one it was technically part two um because part, part one came out part two was really good too um I, i'd say it wasn't as strong as the first and a lot of people had some mixed feedback on the third one and even jamie lee curtis said Fans are either going to love it or hate it. I actually really enjoyed it. I thought it was a really, really good movie. I thought that they took a gamble that eventually paid off. Uh, I don't want to spoil it for you if, if you haven't seen it yet, because I kind of want you to go through that journey yourself as well. Um, but they did a really, really good job uh, in this trilogy. Well, I was really satisfied. See, do you see David Gordon Green's um, like voice? Like when I think David Gordon Green, I think uh, I think. Um, I think George Washington. I think um, I think um, uh, I think like I think you know Joe. I think I think these. I think a, a guy who's not afraid to use local talent, people that aren't necessarily actors. Um, I think um, you know guys that uh, you know I, I, the script is the script is kind of a suggestion, and uh, he's looking for the accents. Do you see his voice and? Uh, also, do you see uh, uh, Danny Danny's voice? Because he's Danny seems Bryce. like such. Yeah. Do you yeah, see I mean, their they, voice in that, or is it kind of like a? Are they uh, uh, like I don't know. I guess I got to watch it to find out. Yeah. So definitely, I mean, because I, I was kind of built. I, I love paying attention to kind of what goes in in the making of a movie and the pre production, uh, yeah. and then kind of seeing what the final works are. So even Danny McBride was saying that they feel like they're part of something that's magical here, but we hope that we don't screw this up because we know the fans love this fran franchise. So he had mentioned that early on and kind of had that, had that humbleness to them. But yeah. again, you were seeing this being created by fans. They yeah. were fans of the franchise, right? They were diehard fans of, of Michael Myers. And, and again, even though it's, it's starting from, you know, part one and kind of going into part two, and I don't want to spoil uh, too much, but they, add to what we already thought existed so like there was a without going too deep into it what they did in the second halloween um film which is part of their trilogy they added about 10 minutes to a scene that we already thought took place 
Oh, and wow. I was like, I was like, man, I want to just watch this. I want to just watch this. Uh, it, there was kind of going back into the seventies. They even had the color of the camera where Whoa. it looked like it was a seventies movie. Whoa. And I was like, I just want to watch this because I'm, I'm, I was getting the nostalgia feeling back, right? Because in this, in this trilogy, it's an older Michael, but we were seeing the younger Michael in the kind of the older scenes, and I, I was really satisfied. I, I wish, again, not not kind of spoiling it for you. I would love for them to do another one uh, in this genre, but they had said that they're That's with this it. crew, they're they're absolutely finished with Blumhouse, yeah. so it's yeah. going to get recreated yeah. at some point. Down and the Anthony road. Michael Hall was in the last one. Second one, he was in the second one. Uh, uh, how was this part? He was good. I'm, I I love him. I, I, lo I love everything that he does. He, his character is sort of the um, kind of the the voice of the town. Um, so he's the one that kind of rallies everyone up, and you know he's he he was brilliant. I mean, it was a very dramatic uh, character that he had to play, and kind of had to go head to head with with Michael Myers, which usually doesn't end in your favor. Um, but he he did really really good. He was he was brilliant. Yeah, and it's, that man to think he's <laughs> he's taking on freaking's exorcist is so is wild, man. How, like wild. That's yeah. like I cannot wait, dude. It's bold, and I just love it, man. I love it. Um, one thing I need to double confirm, it, which I th I think they're doing the same approach where their part one is going to be a sequel to the first Exorcist, I believe, because the mother. Uh, in the first Exorcist, being a brilliant actress, she's going to be in this movie. So I think it's a direct sequel to the first, but I have to double confirm. Interesting, interesting. Uh, I mean, it's still going to be a little girl, I presume, right? Like, uh, yeah, right? I don't, I don't know too much of the uh, the plot. Yeah. It's, it's been pretty secretive so far. I mean, they announced they announced this, I think, right when the third Halloween came out, or like right after. So I'm sure we'll get some details uh, soon. I mean, I, I love that it's the same sort of unit with Blumhouse and David um, Gordon Green as well. So I mean, I I, I have no doubts that they're gonna they're gonna just totally rock it. Yeah, man. I mean, you can't like uh, they 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 they've had such success and made so much money together. I it makes sense that they're gonna keep you know uh, partnering up. I just love that like. <laughs> this has become like a David Byrne Green appreciation podcast. Um, <laughs> but uh, 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 I think I just love the fact that as soon as you think you've nailed him down, you know what I mean? He was kind of this, this he, he, he made his, his mark in this business being kind of this uh, Terrence Malick, you know, uh, capturing uh, people in their most natural state, that, like, you know, no pretense, uh, you know, and then, and then he made a few movies like that. And then he's, he just, he's always keeping, keeping people guessing, you know, and then he makes these broad comedies uh, like pineapple express, which is so funny. And yeah, then the, hilarious. Uh, Your highness. Hilarious. Just so funny, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, oh my God. So I'd, I'd love to get him on the podcast sometime. It'd, it'd be an honor. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan yeah. of his work and would love to get him on sometime and can't wait he's, to see what he does. Yeah, reach out, man. He's pretty cool. You know, he's he's yeah. great. One of my favorites. I do I do want to jump into uh, a very deep project that you're also in. I mean, from what I heard, I mean, you worked on it for like six months, uh, yeah. which was Emancipation, right? When yeah. Ben Ben Foster, who I think is one of the best actors of, of our time, such a great method actor as well. Will Smith, who I just absolutely love. I mean, what was it like? I'm, I'm sure it was it was an intense uh, partaking for you, but I mean, what was it like working on a film for? six plus months and also getting in the character for this role it was wild you know i, I mean I, I say six months but we had we had, had a shutdown for like a month and a half you know um because you know it really just speaks to kind of how hard it was um physically because well, first of all there was you know everything was sad we had a, a, a first they move it from georgia to um louisiana right and then, um, and then we started in the summer months of June and July, um, and we're shutting down every day because of heat, every day yeah. because of heat. So like a month in, we're like, you know, two months behind. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and then the hurricane Ida hit, oh, destroyed yeah. all our sets. Everyone got sent home for a month and a half. Um, so that's really just speaking to how hard, you know, um, how hard it was physically. I mean, it was, it was brutal physically, but you know, um, 
that was kind of secondary to how hard it was spiritually. Just, um, just knowing that this, um, this enslaved man had, had endured, um, this, this journey to, to get back to his family. And, and we all kind of held this sacred obligation to tell this, this man's story. And, um, and, you know, of course I play, um, one of the, one of the, um, you know, bushwhackers, um, or one of the hunters that's, that's kind of serves as Ben Foster's right-hand man to, uh, yeah. down, um, Will Smith's character. Um, it was tough. It was, it was tough physically, spiritually, emotionally, and, uh, and, uh, you know, every aspect of it was, was pretty, was, was pretty demanding. Um, but I, 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 I love the film and I think it's, it's Will's best work. And I think it's some of Ben's best work. And, and I, I was, I felt very grateful just to be there to support them, you know? Yeah, def, definitely. I mean, for me, I mean, I was excited to, to watch it kind of building off the momentum with the, with King Richard and then jumping into this film as well too. Um, such a deep movie. I mean, it's available on the on the Apple streaming network as well. And yep. all of you just did a brilliant, brilliant job. And I mean, for Ren Foster, I mean, he gets so deep into these uh, roles as well. And you work side by side with him as well. I mean, just from working, you know, um, you know, aside him as well, too, and even for you, is it easy to snap in and out of these types of characters? Um, or is it just the brilliance of the, um, the, the work that you guys are putting in? Um. I, I don't, uh, I wouldn't say it was easy, um, to snap in and out, you know, because we were just there for so long. Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, Ben, yeah, Ben's, Ben's terrific. And, and, um, and he was, you know, he kind of stayed in it, uh, pretty consistently, you know, um, and, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I, he, he was just doing fantastic work and, you know, um, and he was a he was a great ally to me. You know, me, him, and Aaron Moten are um, are in pursuit of Will's character the whole time, and 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 that that's exclusively on horseback, you know. And he he was probably the best uh, horseman out of all of us. Um, and he, you know, there was some there was a, a the expectation that you know I had the good fortune of going out there a couple of weeks early to train with you know the horse wranglers and the stuntmen and and ride a horse every day but um and ben was actually very helpful and and you know i, I, I there was even when we were shooting uh, antoine wanted us to go out on saturdays and, and ride horses so, and i think in large part that was probably because i needed most of the work and ben was you know all game and there and, and helping me out every step of the way so um yeah, I'm just so uh, it was really exciting to see to see the work you did and, and uh, to be involved with that. Was this one of those projects where, you know, Antoine and, you know, and the writing team as well and the producers, were you guys able to bring in some of your own like artistic liberties or did you have to kind of stick with what was on the script? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I, I, Bill Collage had written such, such a great script, you know, um, and I think, yeah, I think we kind of stuck to the script, you know? I mean, you know, you always have your ideas. Um, but um, and at the end of it all, it's, it's, a, it's just a director's medium. So it's, um, yeah. you know, it's ultimately, you could shoot it nine different ways. And it's, uh, if you want it the one way, then that's what it's going to be, you know? Um, but again, I thought uh, the movie you made was, was quite beautiful and the work that, uh, Will did and Ben did and, and Charmaine did um, was was I think it's some of the best work this year you know is it uh, I don't know is it getting uh, is it necessarily getting a fair shake um, I don't know I, I, don't, yeah. I really don't know because I I, I I see that film and I, I just think it's it's pretty excellent but I, I, I fully admit it might be hard for me to separate myself from my biases yeah, yeah. And I mean, the, the movie is still, I mean, if it's a few months, you know, out, so definitely it's still kind of catching its legs as well. And also too, from, from what I also hear from a lot of fans is um, the Apple streaming network, it's still relatively new uh, for not a lot. It's not as uh, it's, even though it's been around for a while, but there's not a lot of say subscriptions just yet. I think that's something that Apple uh, still needs to, to work on, but also 
there's a, a handful of upcoming projects. There's, there's huge investments uh, in but like high budget movies that are coming out. Wow. Um, wow. Also, the Martin Scorsese movie um, that's coming out with De Niro and Leonardo DiCaprio. I mean, that's like 250 million plus. So I feel like the Apple network is really going to be that next big, huge streaming platform as well. Um, so I think just having more access to it, because uh, the movie speaks for itself. I mean, it's really, really good. The talent's yeah. really amazing. So I definitely feel like it's going to continue to uh, only get yeah. more uh, momentum as it's catching its legs. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think what, I think that they really kind of uh, uh, stake their claim when they made Coda, which won best picture, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, I mean, these streaming services, they, and understandably so, they, they, they don't, you know, uh, they don't, they don't really care if people see them in the, in the uh, movie theaters. They want the subscribers, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so it's, it's kind of, a, yeah, it's, it's just a part of a, a changing model. And, and uh, yeah. so they've kind of taken that model and said, and, and they've been to the forefront of that, you know, um, so I you know, you, you, you can have a movie like Emancipation, right? Or like, uh, or, or Coda, or any movie that any streaming service does, right? And um, they don't, they might not necessarily want to put it out in theaters because ultimately their goal is to get the subscribers, right? Yeah. But, but um, it, they do oftentimes because if they think they have something that has a worth potential, they, it has yeah. to have a, a X amount of time in, in theaters, right? So, it, it's kind of unfortunate because it could set it's it sets up for a false narrative right so let's say they're like okay because we have to um have a film in theaters for x amount of weeks to uh to qualify for the awards um we're gonna put it in the bare minimum theaters you know not a lot of screenings because ultimately we want people to sign up for the streaming service right yeah and then you and then you see uh but it 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 leaves open the possibility for uh, media to take on this false narrative of, um, yeah. you know, this movie, uh, you know, didn't perform in the box office, but it's kind of a, a disingenuous uh, headline. Well, it is a disingenuous headline because, yeah. you know, these streaming services don't want that, you know, yeah. they want, they want the subscribers. That's what they want, you know? Yeah. I like mean, the same. Quite explicitly. Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Irishman kind of, you know, broke this ground yeah. as well, too, right? It was like $150 million, $200 million movie, came out to Netflix. And I, from what I read, Martin Scorsese really had to push for a limited release uh, just so that they can qualify. And they got yeah. like 10 or 11 Oscar nominations. I don't think they actually won any Oscars, but I mean, 11 yeah. nominations is huge. Yeah. Um, so definitely, uh, I think that something like that. And so like technically it made, nine or ten million dollars across you know all the, the the screenings but at the time it was the number one stream netflix movie of all time so right. i think it does help um to get sort of a limited screening because the word of mouth creates business yep. right yeah so it just needs to get out there and um, but that's why i think part of it is that like i i can admit to i don't have the apple streaming network i was able to watch the film at uh, someone that actually had it um, so more and more people will continue to vote and Apple will figure it out. I'm sure they'll, they'll be able to figure out how to get more subscribers, but creating great content like emancipation and some of these upcoming projects, um, really it's going to help with uh, sort of that uh, release going forward. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. At the end of the day, it's, it's, it's another, it's just another, um, way for, um, filmmakers to, you know, um, to, to make stuff that gets seen and uh yeah. and i love what apple's doing you know i really do i love what they, you know, even netflix i i kind of love they they seems like they've leveled up a little bit you know i think apple was yeah. at the forefront creatively of like yeah. of really taking chances on some really like really cool like um like storytelling netflix mm -hmm. the, you know, it seemed like they kind of fell into this. I don't know. Uh, something was happening there, but lately, I really love that the, the stuff that they're uh, that they're putting out, and, and even the, some of the stuff that I read, um, some of the scripts. I'm like, oh wow, that's cool. You know. Um, yeah, I think I think Netflix was falling into the problem where they were maybe having too much content. I yeah. think. So sure. I think now now they've sort of because like I would have been curious. I, I was wondering why. 
um, the Scorsese movie wouldn't be on Netflix, right? With the success that the Irishman had. Um, yeah. but maybe Apple had the the bigger budget. And again, like it's it's a crazy figure. It's like $250 million uh to make the movie, right? So they they know what they're doing. It's it's gonna create uh more more subscribers and, and more movies of this uh caliber as well. Absolutely. I mean it's 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 it, it and it works. I mean, I heard that the day like I heard that uh, um um the day uh, I could be wrong on this data, but like the like Right around the time that Emancipation was released, they had like uh, like six million new subscribers or something. Wow! You yeah. know, I mean, and and you know, if you if you're looking at um, getting one moviegoers, um, you know, one ticket at like you know fifteen bucks at the movie theater versus yeah. you know uh, you know paying every month for an infinite amount of time, it, it, that's obviously the better business model in the long run. You know, um, you know, so I don't know, you know, it, it, but thankfully there you, you got these movies like Emancipation where you can you, you, you can go see it in the theaters or, or you could see it and, and uh, uh, at your home. I, I haven't you know, when I went to the uh, premiere, I, 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 I couldn't imagine having seen that movie uh, on, a, on my TV after seeing it in the movie theaters. But, you know, I, that's uh, there that's a spectrum of how people regard that experience. You know, some people just don't give a shit and some people it's like, Oh my God. You know, someone was, <laughs> someone was like uh, telling me like, Oh, look, I'm watching. They like, like I'm watching your movie. And it was like a screenshot of their phone. Like they're watching on their phone. I was like, what are you doing? And, it, and I was like, I'm watching your movie. I'm like, turn the movie. Don't watch it on your phone. What are you doing? No. <laughs> no. No, like please, and the, you know, like go to a theater, man. You yeah. you know it's like it's like that's weird to me. It blows my mind. You know the the movie is just movies are just exponentially better in the theater. And if you're not going to see it in the theater, then see it on a great TV. Don't watch it on your phone, man. You yeah, know? yeah. For, fortunately <clears throat> for me, I mean, I'm I'm a movie buff, and I got a surround sound system. So I mean, anything that is obviously of you know ex exciting uh, talent and big budget because these movies are also designed to be with surround sound Dolby digital surround sound you know 7.1 yeah. 5.1 so you don't yep. get that experience with you know airpods you know left and right you're not going to hear these explosions and additional dialogue that sometimes you get from a rear speaker so yeah you're kind of doing a disservice for yourself yeah 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 i agree man i agree and i, I do want to touch on because we just came off the epic finale of Tulsa King, yeah. which depending on when we air this, right? So it's going to be already past it. So fans should have already seen the uh, the finale. And uh, I mean, for me, I mean, I'm, I'm disappointed that it's already over. I mean, it, it just felt like it went by way too fast. I love the yeah. show. You know, the, the marriage uh, for me, it was kind of like, you know, get shorty meets Sopranos. You know, we get Taylor yeah. Sheridan and also uh, Terrence Winter. Yeah. Um so definitely, I mean, I love the show. And with your character, you, without giving too much away, right? Uh, and it's also exciting that we're already renewed for a season two. But with your character, you're sort of that uh, recruit that we get from, you know, Garrett Hedlum. Um, you play yep. Ben Hutchins. But without giving away too much, what was it like, you know, working on the show? And what can fans expect uh, next season? Well, I don't know what, what uh, they can expect next season. It was great, man. You know, I... I uh, I, I was uh, if you asked me sopranos is the greatest show of all time so you know terrence winter yeah, right you know there. um i i would you know i've always been a massive terrence winter fan um so um so and it was great he was very accessible and he was there um you know he's a writer and showrunner and and you know i, I play a a pretty peripheral character and, and uh, you know i don't i certainly don't have a lot of heavy lifting um but I love being there I, and I, I loved uh, everyone was, that was one of those situations where, uh, you know, it just, it's fun to go to work every day and, you know, and um, I don't know what they're, and I loved watching the show, you know, it was definitely totally something uh, I didn't know what it was going to be. And when I watched it, it was different than I thought it was going to be. And, but I, I think it really found its rhythm and, and embraced what it is, which is kind of like you say, like a kid's shorty. It kind of reminded me uh, a lot of the episodic It's Shorty. Is that what you're like, uh, you know, 
Um, and uh, I think it's fantastic. And and I love all those actors. And I love uh, uh, Terrence. And, you know, again, um, and I don't know what they're going to do for season two, but, you know, I hope they involve me. <laughs> no, no, definitely too. I mean, they, they also planted your characters, you know, really, really well. Um, also towards the end, right? Because we see that changing of the guard, you know, between yep. uh, Dominic's character. And uh, we had the privilege of also having uh, Chris Caldovino on our show um, Chris. Times as well, too. Huge, huge fan of his work, right? From Boardwalk and Sopranos. Yep. And, you know, again, hopefully fans, you know, should have seen the finale by the time this episode airs. But, you know, sort of that decision that he makes, you know, to kind yep. of join uh, Dwight. And um, so, yeah, I was really excited because his character, even though, you know, he was on the New York side, he just had some sort of feeling to where, like, he was sort of agreeing with what was going on with Sly and in, in, in Oklahoma. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, I so think, that, that uh, was a thing. I think Chris is doing a great work on it. And Chris was, um, again, man, listen, you, you go, you work on some sets, you know, in some ways, like, uh, uh, movie sets and tv sets are always they can be a little bit like high school you know what i mean and a little clickish and elitist you know what i mean they can't be like that not that set man everyone was super cool and accessible and and chris you know uh who for all intents and purposes is a series regular you know he, he was very kind and and it was fun hanging with him and and uh and and you know everyone's like I, i'm a character actor so like when you people are like what's it like working with Stallone I'm like, Stallone's fantastic um no doubt um but there's a certain point when someone is so massive it just it kind of just like blows your mind breaks your brain so it's like oh yeah there's Stallone what really gets me excited is seeing like actors like um like uh Max Casella and like yeah. Chris and Dominic and uh and Richie Co Costner did a um a, a run um, so again, I didn't have a lot of heavy lifting, but just, just to be kind of there and, and watch them. And, uh, uh, I, I, oh, sorry. I derailed my point. The point is that this was the kind of set where you look forward to, uh, it's a fun hang. Everyone's a fun hang, you know? Um, yeah. so. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. I mean, the fact that you're a huge Sopranos fan, you know, I, I definitely want to do a separate session where we can kind of pick your brain on that. That, that could be a separate episode. Bro, I am the biggest Sopranos fan. I give Chris, I, I, when I was working with Chris, I'd give him shit all the time about like, like he was the reason. He was the reason that everything fell apart, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, yeah. I guess technically, I guess technically it was uh, uh, Tony. Uh, Tony killed Chris's character, right? Michael Imperio. Yeah, just, just like this. He killed him with two fingers over yeah, his yeah. nose. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? No, no, so, no, 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 no. No, I'm talking Chris's character. Uh, Chris, uh, in Sopranos. Oh, oh, um, no, uh, it was Tony Blundetto that killed him. Right, Steve Tony, Yeah, that right, right, right. right. Blundetto. Yeah, uh, he was uh, the one that yeah, killed that's, him. That caused the whole war, right? Yep, my um, brother Billy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, so I, I, so every time, every year, um, when the seasons change around September, October, the first hint of cool air, I feel. Here in Los Angeles, I rewatch Sopranos. It mm -hmm. never gets old. I learn something new every time. I can't explain why it's so great. I mean, I, I could, you know, uh, James Gandolfini, but it's something about it, man. It's just to me, it 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 leveled up where TV was, um, and and it's never been able to be duplicated, and uh, so you know yeah so I, i'm a massive sopranos fan yeah no no definitely as well like for me i mean it was just being so passionate about that specific genre right seeing a show like this where it's just not the it's not a replication of sopranos it's it's just as funny as it is dramatic i laugh more in this show than i am like waiting for a dramatic scene like just in the yeah. first like 10 minutes of the movie with Stallone knocking everybody out with one punch, a grasshopper landing on his jacket. He's like, what the hell was that? You know, getting sprayed by holy water. Like it's hilarious. Like, yeah. like laugh out loud, funny. Yeah, 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 yeah. No doubt. No doubt. No doubt. Right. <laughs> so yeah. you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm really excited for what's in store uh, next season. And definitely we'll, we'll use that as an opportunity to, to talk some more uh, Tulsa King as well. But 
I can't let you sneak out without sharing, you know, because you're you've been consistently busy. Love to hear what exciting projects that you are able to share uh, that are in the works. Well, uh, um, I guess the the next thing I got coming out is um, a, a TV show for Apple. I did um, with Alma Harrell, Natalie Portman, um, um, called Lady in the Lake, um, which is you know um, it's based on a book. It's um, Baltimore um, in this in the sixties and. Uh, can't really talk much about it, but it's um it it's I, I I literally cannot wait. You know, I got I think I got some good good stuff in that, and um every and Alma quickly became uh, someone I hold on the same regard as like a David Gordon Green, uh, just a true collaborator, and uh, uh and just you know yeah, just I can't wait to see what what that is, and then. So that I don't know when that's going to come out sometime 2023. And then as for uh, anything else, I, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. And, I'm waiting to see. Excellent. And we'll and we'll share your projects as they start to get released. So the fans will know where to access them as well. Um, and, and Ronnie, I want to be respectful of your time and also saving us an opportunity for uh, round two as well. But I can't thank you enough for, for making the time to come on. I mean, these are my, favorite types of interviews where we can kind of learn, you know, the journey of, you know, kind of how you got started, getting to talk shop about all these uh, amazing projects that you worked on. And then also, you know, what are some of the uh, movies and shows that you sort of binge watch when yeah. you're not working as well? So, I mean, I, I had a wonderful time uh, meeting. Can't wait to share this with the fans and just looking forward to staying connected as well. Man, I had so much fun, man. Great time. Let's, let's, let's talk about the Sopranos at some point too. We will. So um, actually, um, we're going to air uh, another podcast that we just did, well, actually right before this, uh, with Rick Perez. Um, we've had on the show a few times. He was on Cobra Kai. He's on BMF. Uh, but he's also a huge Sopranos okay. fan as well. So uh, if you watch that interview or ever get a chance to connect, uh, he also claims to be the biggest Sopranos fan as well, too. So I'd love to maybe one day get you guys together. That'd be really fun, too uh is that is that on now can i listen to that now uh so we actually we'll, we'll air it uh this week as well uh, okay, but we've cool. had we've had rick perez on the show actually funny funny story so the second time that we had chris caldovino join uh we had it we had rick perez crash because uh, he was such a big sopranos fan i told him when i get and this was early on in the podcast so we had rick perez crash the interview and actually ask uh, some Sopranos questions as well, too. So if you look, I'll, I'll send the links to you, uh, to that interview, so you can see that one. Uh, and oh, then man. also we'll be sure to air. Uh, and we also talked to Tulsa King as well, because he just wrapped up watching the finale as well. Cool. So uh, love cool. to talk movie shop, and we can set that up as an excuse to get you guys all together. I love it, man. All right, man. Thank you so much, brother. Ronnie, thank you so much. and looking forward to staying connected, and have a great rest of your day. All right, you too, Bubba. Bye. See you. Take care.